Everybody, I need to open up with a word of prayer. I think one of the reasons, you know, when you're not feeling good physically, that's when uh, life seems to, to pile up mentally and emotionally, and you're like, ah! And uh, I thought I had this cold beat, uh, but now it is all in my chest and in my nose. So I would greatly appreciate that. Would you be willing to pray for me as I begin uh, today's message? You don't even have to get up. I'll no, I'm going to get up. No, no, get up. No, let me. Uh, everybody just look at me. You know, wise guy kid. You know what I mean? 40 some years old. I want everybody to, I want everybody just to pretend that they're laying their hands on him. If you can put your hand toward him and, and let's all have a word of prayer. Lord God, we believe your word is precious. Amen? Amen. And we believe, Lord God, that your word is life-giving. Amen? Amen? So I pray for my son, Lord God, that you would bless him now. And that you would take care of his, his, any cough, that you would relieve anything in him. And that he might preach your precious word today. So, Lord God, we ask for your anointing and your spirit to be with him. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 All right. We're going to get through it, and we're going to, we're going to get through it with, with victory, right? And with the joy in all circumstance. Um, i got to say, I love worshiping with all of you. I'm so glad. Oh, a hall. I can you, you can hear it in my nose. All right. Hopefully the, the singing. We're not putting the singing on Facebook today, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it is like, can you feel the digs coming in? We are one in the spirit and one in the Lord. We're just starting, we're amen? Just starting we're just starting. I'm digging my heels in. Um, no, but I really do love uh, worshiping with, with all of you. And it was so, you know, I, I had this plan in my heart to say, I'm going to tell you why it's going to make sense in a minute. And then to see that confirmed with all of you here. Uh, because music has always um, kind of spoken to my soul. It really has. It's something that just gets me. Uh, people who know me really well know that a lot of my emotion comes through when I'm not only I'm making music, but just listening to music. And you know where that comes from? And he thought I was going to keep throwing him under the bus, but it comes from my dad. Uh, when I was little, he used to sit me on his knee, okay? And we would sit in a rocking chair, that, that precious wooden rocking chair, for hours and listen to music. If I say hours, you probably think I'm exaggerating. Pastor Don, how long did I sit on your lap and listen to music? Hours until you, we were zonked out. And then he would fall asleep while holding me, and I'd be like, Dad, Dad, we're not done with the record. We're not done with the record. <laughs> my love of actually old vinyl records, which I share with my brother Jeremy here, um, came from that whole experience. And, and I was thinking... I had a really emotional couple days. You know, you ever have those real, maybe it's because I was getting sick, I don't know. The mind, the body, the spirit, they all work together. But emotional, not in that I, you know, I, I felt like I was a blurry mess or anything, I just really um, sentimental. I was thinking about growing up that way, listening to records with my dad, and I thought to myself, you know, I don't, I haven't done that with my kids as much. And it was so forming to my identity who I am as a lover of music, as a musician, um, as somebody who loves music, everything came from those experiences. And I thought, well, why haven't I done that? And I remember back when I used to, and in fairness to me, life has been a little bit tough over the last eight years. And I have been removed from the circumstances in many respects where I got to do that. And I started to crave and long for that and feel that sense of loss. Like, ah, oh, I wish I could take back some years, and you can't, you can't take the years back. You can't just crawl in a time machine, though I did love Back to the Future as a kid, right? But you can't crawl back into a time machine, go back and take those years back. And I'm not saying that I would, okay? I don't, I'm not saying that I'm living with regret on it, but I did long for it. And, I, and I, I can't tell if it was just one of those moments. I think this came from the fact that I happened to catch, somebody posted on Facebook, a live copy of Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chapin. You know, people know that song? And I'm sitting listening to that song, and that song has always got me, okay, except a terrible cover that this group, Ugly Kid Joe, did, which if you're my age, you remember, and you're going, oh, I know what he's talking about. If you don't, it's okay. But that song always struck a chord with me, always spoke to my soul. And so I, I, I was sitting there listening to this live song, and Harry Chapin opens it up, and he says, you know, my wife actually wrote the lyrics for this song. And that struck me. Well, he said he gave, she gave me the ideas and the concept that I then put into lyrics. And he said, right, right as he was, was about to play it, he goes, and if you don't know the song, it's about you know, a, a father who doesn't have time to be there with his kids. 
and then grows up and the son now doesn't have time to be there for the father. But the whole time that the kid was, was young, he wanted to be like his father, and the father realizes through this odd <coughs> twist of irony, oh, he has grown up just like me. He doesn't have time for me. Like, I didn't have time for him. And, I, and, and Harry Chapin says, you know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. He's telling the audience, this song scares me to death. Now, I know what happened to Harry Chapin just a few years after that concert. <coughs> he died in a tragic accident <clears throat> on a highway in uh, New Jersey, I believe. New Jersey, New York. New Jersey Turnpike. And I'm sitting here watching him say, this song scares me that I'm not there enough for my kid. This kid's name is Josh. I believe it was Josh. And I know what's coming down the pipe. So I, I thought, wow, well, man, I hope he meant that. I hope he didn't miss that opportunity because it's so easy to miss opportunities in life, isn't it? And you think this opportunity will be here tomorrow. This opportunity will be here next week. This opportunity will be here next month. Okay? And so I'm sitting there and I'm listening to it and I Google up there and I saw this quote from his daughter. And she said, his daughter said after the accident, my dad didn't really sleep. He ate really bad. He, I guess he had a lot of tra uh, traffic actually violations and he had a totally insane schedule. And it broke my heart because I put this song, you know, like this guy had it together. He knew what it, but he fell into the same trap that we always do. The same trap that every one of us do. He, he, he thought the opportunities would be there. And as soon as I read that, I was so overwhelmed, I called to my son, Caleb. I said, Caleb, get off the couch. I want you to come here right now and you listen to this song with your dad, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I did this. I think it was a very emotional week. And I tucked him in next to me. And I said, you know what this song's about? It's about dad and he doesn't have enough time for it. And I'm going on and Caleb's like, yeah, uh-huh, dad, okay, right? <laughs> right? And I sit there and I'm listening to it. And he doesn't even know. I got these little tears streaming down my side of my cheeks. He has no concept there. He's like, okay, dad. And then at the end, I'm like, so did you get it? Did you understand what it's about? Yeah, Dad, okay. Can I go back and play Fortnite now? Yeah, go! Okay? And, it, and it moved me that way. <laughs> it just spoke to me, right? And, and Caleb was like the first one I saw there. And, and, uh, and, you know, it was this song and it was another song. It's a song called Release by Pearl Jam. Some of you, again, may know, or if you're my age, and some of you may not know. But this song, Release, I'm going to get too caught lost in, in the musicality of it all, but it's important to me, and it's important for the point I want to make. And in this song, Release, and this is actually the song I want to I want to really grasp the heart of what I think God was putting on my heart. Because this one gets me because it's a true story. The writer is a singer named Eddie Better, and Eddie Better didn't know his dad. Okay, he knew this guy that would show up every once in a while. He speaks freely about it. It's in this um, this documentary about him. And this guy would show up, and he they, he thought he was just a family friend. And he found out after that man passed away that that was his dad. And he speaks in this song about this tremendous loss of, I know I'm like you somehow. And there's a really deep spiritual point for me in this. Yeah, you're pointing up to God, Luke. I know, yeah. Just you were just listening to it. All right, Luke. Right? <laughs> of, I know I'm like you somehow, and I'm waiting up for you to speak to me. You can take this pain away. And I thought, oh man, how many people approach God like that? How many people approach our Father, God our Father? How many people approach their heavenly parents saying, I don't know you, and I don't know who I am to you, and I don't know how, how much you value me, and I'm waiting up in, in the dark here for you to speak to me. You know, speak to me. I know I'm like you somehow, and we're born in God's image, it says. He knew us from the womb. He created mankind in his image. And that song always gets to me. And, and I have this picture of this guy walking in on family, vac uh, family, you know, not vacation, family holidays, seeing his son. And for whatever's going on, and I stand in no judgment of the man. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the circumstances were. I have no right to sit there in any judgment at all. But coming around to see his son, but not ever being able to seize that moment, and seize that opportunity and say, hey, dad's here. And the pain that then gets produced through music and through all these things that come after it. And I thought about missed opportunities. Why do we miss so many opportunities? We, you know, we think to change the world, it's, it's at, at the big macro level through, through politics and through this and that. When changing the world, I think, starts with one life at a time. It starts with releasing one pain at a time. 
It starts with releasing pains, you know, with our children, releasing pains in our marriages, releasing pains with long lost friendships, releasing pains with long lost acquaintances, people that, that have, have broken relationally <coughs> and, and take those scars with them. Why do we miss all these opportunities? And, and I, I believe, my, my opinion on this, and I, I believe Pastor Don feels the same way because on those rocking chairs we would have long, long talks about all things under the sun and why are there stars, Dad? And what do you think people think about this? And, and so I, I have to believe that there's some dysfunctions that we have, some insecurities, some fears of rejections, some fears of failure, fears of giving ourselves to something wholeheartedly and have it being taken away that keep us with a safe wall. And if people break through that wall, then a very distinct mask that we wear. So people can't tap into those places that could hurt us. Do you feel that? Do you know where I'm coming from on this? We guard those things like they're precious jewels. Those innermost feelings and emotions, we guard and we make sure that people can't get in there because we don't want to be hurt. But that's where I think so much loss comes from. Those missed opportunities. And you know, I could never understand, <clears throat> probably because of the way I was raised, we talked about God. Like I said, three years old, I'm asking questions about God while we're listening to the Beatles records on, on the rocket chair. Go figure, right? In some cosmic way, that must make sense, right? <laughs> but if you know there's a God and you know that's our common ancestry, that's our, that's our lineage, that's how we're created. That's, he says he, even, he gives us his seed, right? That that seed that's in Jesus is then given into us. And, and we're in his image and we're in his likeness. How could you want, not want to know more? How come we don't, we don't have that same, or do we have that same longing to know? Just like in that song release, I'm like you somehow and I don't know you. And how does that not become one of the most sincere passions of our life? And as I look at relationships, as I think about people in the stories and the songs that I just mentioned, <clears throat> I guess that's just part of being broken. Sometimes we just would rather protect than to throw caution to the wind and say, I'm all in. Tell me you can hear me. Tell me you're here. I can see some of you feel what I'm saying right now. Isn't that something to give it all for? And, and as I look at Jesus, that's what I see him. He, he had his mind right. Right, Pastor Don? He had his mind and his priorities right of who his father was. And that's his desire is to share and say, hey, you know what? I see him in you. And you know what's wild about Jesus? He went to the people that other religious people thought had no signs of God in them. The people that were worth nothing to the religious elite, they didn't, ha they didn't reflect God. And he looked at those people and he said, you know what? I can see that spark in you. You're like him somehow. Why don't you come home? Why don't you come? I want to I wanna show you that. He says, as you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I want to introduce you to somebody. And I thought, oh my goodness. Imagine Eddie Vedder, Jeremy, right? If he had a sibling who said, hey, that's him. That's the one you've been looking for and searching for this whole time. He's right there. And you know what? He isn't going to reject you when you come. He is die longing. He sent me to get you so you can know each other. You know, I love talking about the cross. I really do. And, and that's a, a pivotal part of the gospel. But I love that Jesus went to the people who were told they had no relation to God. And he said, hey, I see dad in you. That spoke a lot to me this week. Maybe it was just, maybe it's because I grabbed Caleb and gave an extra squeeze this week. Maybe that's where my head's at. I don't know. But that's what's touching me. And so I look, we're going to get into the scripture <coughs> from Mark. <coughs> Mark chapter 10, verse 46. It says, and they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd, and, uh, and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus was sitting on the roadside. Some of you have heard me preach this text before. It just spoke a little differently, differently to me today. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. 
And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now why am I bringing that text into it? <clears throat> In this translation it says he threw off his cloak. I think it's maybe the NIV and some of the other translations. It says he tossed his cloak aside. It's an odd little detail to put in. If I was writing a narrative about a blind man receiving sight and him running after Jesus, I don't know that I would have taken the time to say that he threw away his cloak. Who cares what he did with his cloak? It's a jacket. Okay? Except, what is a jacket for a blind man? How did they use a cloak? To sit on. Money, income. Oh, you guys got it, yeah. Money, income, and to sit on. That's what they do. They didn't have the cardboard box that says, please donate. And have that back then. What they did is they put, they put their cloak down, and they sat down, and people threw money in the cloak. Why did they have to throw money in the cloak? Because he's blind. So what he would do is he'd wrap up the cloak <coughs> when it was all done, and he'd know that all the money is in the cloak. That was his livelihood. That was the way he survived. That cloak, the fact that he tossed it away, is very significant because what it's saying is the old ways that I've known to survive, I am tossing aside for something new. And that, I think, is a very significant point in this text that is often overlooked. Most of the time you'll hear this text preached upon, it's about the courage that, that Bartimaeus had to speak up after he was re being rebuked. I think that's courage. But if you ask me, having dealt with people, and I, I bet you if you ask Pastor Don, he would probably agree with this, having, having counseled with people for 15 years or with him, for, counseled people for 40 years, one of the most <laughs> courageous things that anybody can do is to take whatever that survival method they learned since this high and grew up on how to protect themselves on how to cushion themselves, on how to make them feel safe, and say, I want something different in my life. I'm tossing that away because that is actually keeping me stuck. And I would submit to you today that that is the greater courage than him yelling. I know because I've sat in the room, this is no lie, with somebody, I want you to think about this because it's not all physical limitations, it's emotional too. I've sat with people who were in their late 70s who said, you know, I had such a bad relationship with my dad, I've never been able to give my heart to any man. And I feel like I have nothing now. 79 years old, been holding on to that cloak. That old way of surviving. That old way of navigating through life and haven't been able to let it go. What opportunities do we miss along the way when we protect ourselves and guard ourselves and have become so fastened to the ways that we protected ourselves and made us feel secure and held on to the dock that we never got to set sail? It happens all the time. I can tell you that from counsel with you. Pastor Don can tell you that. You probably already know that in your own life. Sometimes you have to give something up to gain something more. We just said this in a football game yesterday. Sometimes you got to give a little to gain a little bit. You got to be willing to let something go so that healing can flood. There is no healing. Every time there's healing, there's change. And every time there's change, there has to be something that is released and let go. Somebody who has a broken leg has a crutch. And that crutch gets them from point A to point B. But if they ever want to go from point B to point C, they eventually have to let the crutch go. And I submit to you today that most of the dysfunctions that we have relationally, most of the dysfunctions that plague our life, come initially because we learn to survive from them. I know that's a heavy concept in a room that's getting hotter and hotter, at least for me, up under these lights, but it's a, but it's a true concept. Anger. You know what anger is? It's a way of controlling. I don't want you to hurt me, so I'm going to... Because I learned somehow when I was young that if I get angry enough, other people will back away and I'll protect myself. You know, we bring, it to, we bring it to our jobs, we bring it to our friendships, we bring it to our marriages, we bring it everywhere we go. 
passive aggressive behavior. Ah, I find a way to get my point across without treading too much. I'm safe. A little bit of fight and a little bit of flight. It's the same survival instinct, just coming out a different way. All the things we're going to talk about in this series on getting the mind of Christ, the dysfunctions, the negativity, the, they all come from a way of trying to learn control. I don't even know where I am in my notes anymore. That's all right. <laughs> you know, tell me, tell me these statements aren't true. I, these are just things that I wrote, I jot down. They actually came to me today. The angriest of people are often the ones who have been the most abused. The most withdrawn people are usually the ones that were most neglected. The most passive are usually the ones who have been the most repressed. The most obnoxious and arrogant are usually the ones hiding something and are the most insecure. Tell me it's not true. Tell me we don't wear a lot of masks and hold on to a lot of old survival instincts. See, to gain healing, to get what Jesus has to offer. Bartimaeus had to throw away the only way he knew to survive. Think about how courage that takes. What courage that takes. He's got no education. At that point, he still has no sight. No training, no trade. That man is going to help me see God and help me see. What a beautiful metaphor that is. I'm throwing away the old distance makers. I'm throwing away the cloak of security because I want something more. <clears throat> you know what that's called? Carpe diem. Seize the day. Seize the moment that's here before you. Because there's, a, I sat two weeks ago, and I went up on the big E, and there was this big, I got to go up on that 25th thing and knock on the wall about God knocking on the doors of our heart. What was nice about being up there is it echoed. Sounded like a big boom, 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 right? And, and can we hear God knocking? The first step was the shepherd coming out and saying, listen, you can hear me knocking. But the second part of that, the follow-up is having the courage to then follow, to say, I'm willing to give up my old ways. Man, we hold on to so many ways and relationships that we bring into God. Well, I don't know if God will accept me. You know how many times I heard people say, I don't know if I can come into church with a place burned down. I've done this. I've done that. I, I'm sure God doesn't want anything to do with me. And Jesus comes up to the most broken of people, the people with the addictions, the people selling their bodies, this and that. And he says, you know what? You've got that seed of our father in you. And I think it's time you meet him. And it made all the religious people who thought they were so great grand infuriated because Jesus knows how to break down the walls of dysfunction he knows how to bring physical healing but he also knows how to bring emotional healing he brings it all because he brings spiritual healing but you've got brothers and sisters you've got to be willing to toss the cloak of the ways you've done things to go out and have the courage to step for something new amen, amen. system is that cloak. What about all that change? What if this Jesus thing doesn't work out? What if I never see the Father? Can I, what if I die without this cloak? So they called to Bartimaeus, cheer up! On your feet! He is calling you and throwing his cloak aside. I love that. This thing. I, I can't say it enough. This thing that kept him alive throwing it away he went after Jesus to me that takes courage Bartimaeus received sight physically and spiritually <coughs> excuse me he has a perfect view of his heavenly father staring before him in the eyes of Jesus now the verse says this and I think this is noteworthy immediately he received sight and followed Jesus you know what the text never says as he began to follow Jesus, he reached back for the cloak and took it along with him as he followed. You don't ever read that in the text. He never went back to the old way because he knew it was an obstacle.
to the healing that Jesus had for him in the new way. Every one of us here, myself included, my wife will amen this, I'm sure, has a cloak that makes us feel like we're in control. It's a lot of methods. I'm going to come down on my knee, right? Literally and physically and mentally and metaphorically. Tell you, I have a lot of ways that I use to keep control. To keep the ends of the cloak tightly grasped so the rug doesn't get pulled out from me. <clears throat> Moment of confession. Those cloaks that I have have been the single biggest obstacles in my relationships with my kids, with my wife, with my siblings and it's all about control it's all about survival every one of us in humanity has this funny wiring to survive emotionally to make it through the pains the heartaches the loss the grief <clears throat> today if you hear him knocking have the courage to toss the because when he calls you to healing, to receive sight, he calls you to toss the cloak. When he calls you to not be lame and heal you from being lame, he calls you to toss the crutch. Wherever he heals your life, he beckons you to toss whatever way you used to fill that void. <clears throat> so yeah, I think about that song release. This documentary said when Eddie Vedder first played it, after the first time they did it live, in the middle of the stage, right after playing it, I don't even think the set was over, he snuck around backstage and wept. <clears throat> if you don't know God, if you're sitting in a place here where you've known him, but you've never had intimacy with God, and yes, I do think God calls us to have intimacy heavenly father who wants to love and cherish to sit on the knee with you and rock in the rocking chair and listen to the, the choirs of angels are you too jammed up <clears throat> has life thrown you too many curveballs too many obstacles are you able to toss the cloak look up to him and say I'm like you somehow. Release me. 